Presented by Caltech. I'm uh, Jed Buckwall, professor of history here at Caltech. And <clears throat> this is our annual William and Myrtle Harris Distinguished Lecture Series in Science and Civilization. <clears throat> and it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's seminar. The Harris Distinguished Lecture Series began in 96 with generous support from the Harris family and their interest and contributions in our activities have enabled us to bring distinguished scientists, historians, philosophers, and other analysts of science <coughs> to lecture on issues in the subject and its relationships to society. Bill Harris, who is in the audience with us today, Bill, you can raise your hand, <laughs> thanks earned his bachelor's and master's degree from Caltech in mechanical engineering in 49 and 50. He's an active member of the associates and member of the president's circle. And he's always conveyed to us that his contact with humanities at the institute enriched his life. And over the years, we've had the pleasure to host many outstanding scholars, scientists, and public figures under the auspices of the Harris Lectures. In addition, the Harris Endowment has made possible the Einstein Centennial Distinguished Lecture Series in 2005 and again in 2015, and seminars jointly co-sponsored with the Beckman Institute, the Division of Biology, of Engineering and Applied Science, and of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy. Today, <coughs> we have the special pleasure of welcoming <coughs> two professors from Harvard. Peter Gallison is Joseph Pellegrino university professor and director of the collection of historical scientific instruments. He's a very well-known distinguished historian of 20th century physics, sole author of three and co-author of one very influential volumes, including How Experiments End, Image and Logic, Einstein's Clocks, Poincaré's Maps, and with Rainey Dastin, Objectivity, as well as numerous path-breaking articles on both the history of physics and the culture of science more broadly. And like all first-rate scholars, Peter began work on new and different projects. In the first, a film titled The Ultimate Weapon, The H-Bomb Dilemma, which was about the political and scientific decisions behind the creation of the first hydrogen bomb in the United States, and which premiered on the History Channel in 2000. It's a penetrating depiction of the politics and science behind the development of this ultimate weapon for which Peter wrote the script. It deserves to be seen as widely as possible, particularly given the continued dangers posed by nuclear proliferation today. Following this success, Peter began a collaboration with our second speaker, Rob Moss. Rob is the chair of the Department of Visual and Environmental Studies at Harvard, who's produced numerous film projects over the years, including The Same River Twice, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2003, and earlier autobiographical and essay films, including 1981's River Dogs, and in 1991, The Tourist. He's advised the Sundance Festival's Doc Edit Lab since their beginning in 2004, and he and Peter joined forces to direct the film Secrecy in 2008, which is another probing account of signally important issues, this time concerning, as they describe it, the vast and visible world of government secrecy in all of its aspects. It was the winner of the Special Jury Award for Documentary Features at the Independent Film Festival in Boston and was named Best Documentary at the Newport International Film Festival. Well, they also collaborated on an intellectually and visually stunning video triptych installation entitled Landscapes of Lost Time in Graz. Austria in 2015, which shows the devastation created by, among others, the disastrous Fukushima meltdown of 2011, as well as images of the Savannah River nuclear weapons plant in South Carolina and the weapons waste burial site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. They developed the installation while working on their second collaboration, which is the film we will see today, Containment on the social, cultural, and scientific issues surrounding the complex questions posed by nuclear waste. That film premiered in 2015 and has been seen at more than 40 festivals around the world. So I ask you to welcome the two of them. We will 
<coughs> they will have a brief introduction, we will show the film, and then afterwards there'll be a question and answer session. Peter and Rob. You said it. First, I want to thank you, uh, Jed and Diana, for hosting us and for the Caltech community. I uh, have been here quite a number of times over the years, and it's always with great pleasure that I have a chance to come back. Uh, my colleagues and friends in history of science and in physics and other disciplines uh, make this uh, a remarkable place and a privilege for us to be able to show the film here. Um, this is a film we'll talk more about uh, in the question and answer period where we'll be happy to address really anything that interests you from the, the topic and sites that we look at to some of the broader uh, themes uh, and filmmaking, music, sound design, whatever uh, interests you. Uh, I, you know, it's a project that Rob and I spent about five years working on and it took us to a great number of sites in the midst of which that happened, uh, it was causing us to reorganize the film in all sorts of ways. But I, I think we came away with enormous respect for the communities, for the experts, the scientists, uh, the people who are involved willy-nilly or in the design and policy aspects of this problem of containing nuclear waste for a period far longer than human civilization has been around. And it's that provocation, what, in a way, the, to paraphrase Immanuel Kant, the kind of necessary and impossible problem of dealing with waste that will be here and very well may be here long uh, after our culture is not, that provoked us uh, to make this film. And we look forward very much to talking about it with you. Rob? Briefly to say that um, it's an honor to be here. That <clears throat> I'm a filmmaker who teaches in the academy, um, and the whole notion of filmmaking and scholarship and filmmaking and science and how we think about all, how all these things mix together is a big part of my world, and um, it's just a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to the conversation afterwards. When I call on you, then... Um We'll bring a microphone to you so that we can hear you. Uh, one of these will bring them to you. Yes, sir. Um, I, I guess I didn't catch exactly how many years it was that they were planning on worrying about it, but I don't remember them telling me what and why they had to stop worrying. And it's the end of civilization, what they're predicting. And, and is the period going to be long enough and the holes that they dig going to be big enough so isostatic equilibrium becomes a problem? So the, um, there's a lot of debate about what time scale they should work on. The half-life of plutonium is 24,100 years. Generally speaking, they, they figured to get down a factor of 1,000, they should look at 10 times the half-life. So for cesium-137 or strontium-90, which are two of the most prevalent isotopes, for instance, from um, other kinds of accidents, uh, that uh, you would take 300 years if their half-life is 30 years. But 240,000 years seemed to them just impossible. They just That was so far in excess of anything imaginable that they figured getting this sort of order of magnitude of uh, 24,000 years to 10,000 years would be twice recorded human civilization and then they figured they'd pass the baton forward from 10,000 years in the future. Um, the salt has been there for about 250 million years. This is the Permian Basin. It's a uh, many cycle evaporation of a huge inland ocean that was there in the deep past. And um, just the existence of the salt is prima facie evidence that you don't have massive flooding of, 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 of uh, fresh water coming through and dissolving the salt. And they had reasons to think that uh, it would easily hold up for another 10,000 years uh, if it had been there for 250 million. The biggest threat that they worried about, I mean, you've seen some of the things they worried about in the, in the film, um, was not so much that the salt would uh, 
decay or uh, otherwise deteriorate. In fact, salt is compressible under pressure, and it, it insists the, uh, the, the, the drums and crushes them. So it comes in in a tunnel about at, the, at this depth, which is about, about 2,100 feet down, at about 15 inches per year. So the tunnel would close up relatively quickly. Uh, if you don't work on it, they really bad things happen, pieces of the ceiling fall and so on. So pretty quickly it's going to seal up, and that was the hope was that it would remain that way. One of their biggest worries was that oil drilling, and there's a, there's a lot of oil under there. In fact, as it turns out, in recent years, it's the biggest source, it's the biggest discovery <coughs> of oil that we have in the continental United States, and one of the biggest in the world. So there's a very distinct possibility that they would drill down there. And all around the site, you can see drilling. In fact, if you look at the site from space, you can see the drills all around. So that was their big worry, and that's why they have to mark. Because if you don't mark, you could say, well, then nobody would notice it. But between the wildcat drillers and the, and the big companies that are buying uh, land access there for drilling, they will drill. So that's what the markers are for, and then they had to worry about what if something comes from underneath or you know, these other scenarios that they had. But the, so the, the biggest worry was not so much that there'd be a, a failure of is, a isostatic equilibrium. It was over this period that you would actually have people drilling down to it, drilling through the site down to compressed salt brine, brine, briny water, and that the briny water under pressure would come up, gather radioactive materials from the site, and bring it to the surface. On a, on a, that was their biggest worry. Uh, congratulations on an extremely <coughs> terrifying uh, experience. Um, I mean, watching it. Um, I guess I have two questions, one a quick one and one a longer one. The, the quick one is, what, um, what marking method did they eventually choose? I hope it was the, the nasty spikes coming up. Um, the second question is, why did you choose not to discuss containment in the sense of um, security? Big T and all that sort of thing. Um, that's it. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the second question, the, we worked off of the scenarios. It was one of our foundational ideas is that um, when they, in 1991 or so, when they were writing these scenarios, they came up with all these kinds of ideas. Those scenarios reflected, um, as always future scenarios do, our anxieties of the present. And the present at that time, security wasn't one of the major issues. So um, in now, it would be right at the top of the list. How would you, <clears throat> how could you protect the sites from, from people intentionally wanting to go in? But this was about how people would unintentionally go there, how they overlook the marking systems. How do you make a marking system that would take into account this overlooking quality? And those became the scenarios, and that became the foundation for the film. But your point is well taken. I mean, the anxieties at the moment would be quite different. One of the things we really loved was the way in which the scenarios, while absurd in a way, were understood to be absurd by the writers of the scenarios. I mean, they understood that they were provoking a question that couldn't be actually answered. But by asking the question, it could maybe help the markers panels think about how to actually mark the site. Um, and then the marking of the sites themselves, to answer the first question, um, one of the things is, is that um, everybody, un everybody understands that, <clears throat> that the longer you can wait to actually mark the site, to actually even decide how to mark the site, the better off you are because materials change and ideas change. Um, there, are, there was a way, and they did come up with a kind of marking system, which was a you know, marking system at the top, marking systems underneath, taking into account, you know, if you saw it from space, if you came from underground, multiple languages, um, sort of study centers. I mean, those things, that has been designed, but they're also trying to turn the site into a, um, a high-level waste site. The people on the site would like to turn it into a high-level waste site. And if that's the case, then this whole notion of how to mark, this, to mark the site would then be moved even further into the future, and then those those plans would change as well. So as long, just to say, as long as there's um, operations on the site, you don't need to mark. I mean, there's 
uh, you know, armed guards with military equipment that go around and will respond almost instantly to anybody that intrudes on the site. When we were there, we, we asked for permission from the head of the site, who we were filming, we were talking to, at the end of the day, we said, could we, could we film uh, tomorrow morning early? And they said, sure. You know, I said, well, we don't want to get shot. And they said, oh, no, no, you won't get shot. We'll tell the guards, you know, the, the walking huts, these are a private security force. The walking huts won't shoot you. you know, we, no problem. So we get there. It's 5.30 in the morning. It's early. It's, and um, set up the camera. And sure enough, this truckload of guys with flak suits and, you know, automatic weapons jumps out. And what are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, well, no, no, look, we just talked to the head of the site. You know, what do you mean? Why don't you call him up? Well, what do you mean? We're going to call him up at 5.30 in the morning. No, we're not going to do that. And so we did back and forth like this, and eventually they decided it was, they got somebody to say it was, it was okay. But as long as those people are there, you don't need a complicated marker in the UN languages with uh, uh, radar reflectors. They have, these, they have these little ceramic <coughs> plates that are buried in the thousands there. There's a design for that. So that even if the markers were gone, once you started digging, you'd start finding these little things. That, there was debates about should we use pictures, or you saw the, you know, these different things were alluded to in the film. Do you use pictures? Do you use text? Do you use multiple languages? Is the Rosetta Stone your monument? Do you want to actually have pictorial sequences, like kind of graphic novel sequences there? What, how, do you, how do you communicate with the future? And there were a lot of debates. They did not agree on this. That's the marker panel debated these things furiously between 88, 89, and 91, 92. The good news is that they didn't shoot us. Yeah. <laughs> Say it again. Well, it was predicated on opening the site. They were, the, the government said you can't open the site until you come up with a plausible marking system. So they convened these people in order to create plausible marking systems. And so they convened all these really interesting people to do it, but it was, it was right then, not so much because that was the moment to solve the nuclear waste problem, but that was the moment to solve that problem to open the site. They have to have a, a model, a monument <laughs> structure on file at all times. When they finished this, they chose this menacing earthworks, these sort of jagged things, not, uh, that would be, that was their leading contender. Now what's on file is, uh, if you imagine sort of a rectilinear Stonehenge uh, with uh, squared off monoliths around, that's, uh, and then a berm, uh, that's, that's, the, that's what's on file right now. Uh, two independent questions. One is, how well had the geology actually been studied? Uh, I'm thinking of how, how many things, for example, they didn't know about Boulder uh, Black Canyon that were only realized after in the Boulder Dam project. The other one is, how seriously is uh, the, if you want, boogeyman cultural heritage to be studied to be injected into the culture, which seems like probably the only way to get really long-term awareness. How well was the uh, geology studied? Well, the, um, the issue with the salt was whether there were deep underground uh, streams or defects caused by flowing water. Um, the basic structure of the site uh, in terms of the potassium chloride that's in the upper layers of the salt, the salt itself, and then what went on underneath that was pretty well understood. And I don't think they were very surprised uh, by anything that they found. But the um, geology where you have, um, especially in sort of limestone areas, these complicated and hard to map <coughs> underground passages where water flows or has, fl has flowed can be uh, very challenging. That hasn't been the problem. The biggest problem they had was the one that led to the accident there, uh, and that was that salt is, uh, is constantly moving under pressure, which I mentioned before, and they had a ceiling, they've had some ceiling falls, uh, and then the fire, and there was a truck fire underground, and that's no fun at all because it, you know, there's oxygen and aeration problems. Uh, for the workers, and then um, the issue of what was in the tanks, which they really hadn't understood well, this kitty litter question they, they, they used. Someone should have written down inorganic kitty litter to absorb the liquid, and they wrote down an organic 
kitty litter and the organic kitty litter mis mixed with the potassium salts to make a patented you know, explosive and it, it, it caused it. Um, the second part of the question was about what, that in some ways the only way to really think about the future is to make a cultural marker. I think that was your question. And the boogeyman question. I mean, it is seriously considered. It's just hard to ignite. It's like, in a way, looking at it, it's like that would last longer if you could make such a thing work. Precisely, you know. We talked about Smoky Bear, which has, Smoky Bear has its origin right near there. So it was part of the local lore. You had another part of the question. Question in the back. When I have argued with people about uh, nuclear waste being a solvable problem, I've pointed out that it's very easy to detect. But in the context of, of, of your theme, uh, detecting it depends on preservation of science, technology, and knowledge and equipment, uh, which you um, mentioned as, as if it can't be done or can't be guaranteed. Um, did you consider trying to make make these kind of points with a little more emphasis or, or propose some solutions along these lines? It's a very good question. One of the things they worried about was that there would be cyclic collapses and formations and reformations of society. You know, when the Roman Empire f fell, Britain, was not, you know, the antecedent entity to Britain, went from being a pretty advanced and sophisticated, literate trading society to the Stone Age in a generation. And the, the fear was that you would find yourself, if you had oscillations of collapse and reconstruction of, of civilization, that you could find yourself between a kind of 1880 and 1920 area. That is to say, sophisticated enough technically to dig deep wells and not sophisticated enough to detect radiation. Once you can detect radiation, you could build that into your you could figure that the society would be testing for that as they dug. Um, if you didn't have enough sophistication to dig a deep well, you're not a problem. So it's, it's what they were worried is crossing that kind of intermediate stage of sort of 1890, uh, 1895, 1900 uh, level. So that's what they were worried about. We didn't tr tend to, um, you know, we thought that what was interesting was really capturing how this group of people, and they came from many disciplines, saw their world rather than trying to editorialize, you know, oh, this one could be done better, or that one could be done worse, or this was exaggerated, but rather to try to assess what happened. Congress, here, the sequence was, Congress said, you can build this waste site, but you have to follow the regulations of the Environmental Protection Agency. The Environmental Protection Agency says, okay, we'll do what we always do. How long is this stuff toxic? You know, when we have an insecticide or other things, we figure out its toxic duration, we regulate it over that period, and so on. So they said, well, the toxic period is 24,100 years for a half-life. And uh, so then the EPA said, okay, well, we'll have to go back. And they, they had public meetings and federal publications in the Federal Register. Uh, most people said it's crazy to try to regulate over 10,000 years. One of the Native American groups wrote in and said, actually, the problem is the opposite. Uh, we've been here for 25,000 years. Your archaeologists say we've been here for 15,000 years, but a lot longer than 10,000 years. And we're staying here. We're not going anywhere. You people, you move in and out. You know, you migrate. We're not migrating anywhere. We've been here. We're going to stay here. And so we think the 10,000-year period is way too short. Anyway, it becomes a rule published in the Federal Register, and then it has to be uh, abided by by the DOE. So the DOE says, all right, Sandia Labs hires all these people, um, math, I mean, uh, physicists, metallurgists, chemists, uh, 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 astrophysicists, who's also an award-winning science fiction writer, um, 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 and a uh, semiotician, a, a, lingu a linguist, uh, and all these people, and they get them together, and they write these reports, two reports. First, the scenarios of the future, and then using those, another report, what kind of marking system should we have? So we tended not to sort of say, oh, I, they, their analysis of the, of the history of technology is wrong, but rather to say, <coughs> how, what is the spectrum of things they were concerned with? 
And they organized their, these future predictions in the form of the legacy of what was known as the Delphi Project, which Gordon and other people had been involved with. This was a RAND project that developed forms of future scenarios for predicting weapons development after World War II and thinking about the future that way. So that was the sequence, uh, how, 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 it, how it developed. Just one more thing about this is that in some ways what interested us was setting the problem in time um, as a problem. And I totally take your point about trying to find solutions for this. And I think that there probably are. And I think that people in this room can help think about it. And we were trying to think about it too. But the problem of scale in the film, and if we're thinking about public policy, how to begin to think about scale, and then how to think about that as a piece of cinema as opposed to a piece of writing for whatever that's good or not good. So um, there's a couple moments in the film in which this idea of scale um, Alison McFarland's talking about the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years and 240,000 years for it to go to nothing. And, you know, as she's saying this, the woman who's checking the truck of radioactive materials going from Savannah River to Whip is sort of checking the truck. And as she says 240,000 years, she, the woman <laughs> kicks the tires of the truck. And there's a kind of thud. And I think this is like safety. Like this is kicking the tires for 10,000 years. It's like this moment of like big scale and this tiny little moment of kicking the tires, for whatever that sort of means, that juxtaposition. There's a moment when um, <clears throat> talking about sending these things into outer space and to aliens and thinking about this and um, um, the speaker is saying, you know, that one of the things that moved him about this is that they were thinking about people so far into the future uh, in the sort of, and that, that one of the things that moved him is that we're thinking about 10,000 years in the future, and we're thinking about you. And then the image is this woman in a grocery store who's just stolen a grape, and it's just put it in her mouth. This is how I imagine it. And she's just caught at that moment. She's looking at the lens. And this sort of human moment of being caught at that moment, um, this sort of, this is like, how are you supposed to communicate? Aliens are supposed to kind of see this picture and know something about human beings. In fact, as a picture, it says a lot about us as, as human beings. And again, this sort of scale of sending things into deep space and this human moment and trying to communicate those two things. And at the end, Mr. Sasaki is driving for the 200th time. I was trying to calculate how many more times he's gone since we were there. It's like now 600 times probably as opposed to 200 times. Um, <clears throat> and as he pulls up to his driveway, he turns on his left turn signal. And I go, like, <laughs> who's he warning? <laughs> who's, who's behind him? Uh, the place is completely evacuated. But it's like our habit or something human about that. These are moments that don't really rise to the level of analysis, but they, they rise to some human level that films can do that other media can't necessarily do. And something that was, we had to kind of discover through the making of the film. So as our scientific understanding of cancer and our medical technologies for treating it become more and more effective, do you think this will change the way we approach policy relating to like ethics and such of this low-level radioactive contamination? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that some people that uh, some of the scientists that who work there said was that, you know, by the time we, you know, close this site, hundreds of years from now, if it's that long. I mean, technically, the site was supposed to close about 30 years from now, but you know, if it gets extended as a burial site for surplus plutonium, for fuel rods, for other things, it could go much farther. Uh, maybe we'll have solved the problem of cancer, and then uh, who cares? You know? um, one person, I once gave a, a talk about this uh, at the Naval Research Laboratory. And someone said, you know, I don't really understand the problem. You put some landmines around the site. The first couple of people go in, they get blown up, and they stop going there. <laughs> I mean, nobody walks around the places where there's a lot of unexploded ordnance in the battlefields of France. And they're marked off. It says, you know, unexploded ordnance here. Don't go. People don't go. So uh, I mean, people, uh, you know, there are different ways to think about uh, this. But you know, for all the risks, Rob and I ended up thinking, you know, as Alison McFarlane says in the film, if the alternative is leaving it on the surface, it's probably better to get it underground. And um, not that burying it underground is a panacea or you know, makes it impossible for anything to go wrong. We've seen things can go wrong. Um, but uh, 
it's always compared to what, as the jazz song says. And leaving it in 55-gallon drums stacked up outside of Los Alamos is not a great solution, because for sure those are going to leak. I mean, guaranteed, right? Those are just crappy old 55-gallon <coughs> drums filled with uh, radioactive salts, and they'll, they'll eat through the barrels. They'll leak. And even taking some of these barrels in now, they had a leak once, and they had plutonium-238 spill in one of the hangar areas and the staging area at Savannah River. It's, it's, you know, it's a tough problem. And as you see, the older ways of disposing of the waste sometimes were catastrophically bad. They just shoved them off the side of the road or they left them in these rotting barrels. So I think you know, getting them underground is a good idea. But you know, a lot of times, I think, people like to think, look, there's a perfect solution. I'd rather think, like, what's the better solution of the ones we have? I wonder if you considered uh, what you might do with the stuff rather than how to protect the next X generations from the stuff. What I'm referring to is, yes, plutonium has a half-life. By the way, plutonium-238 has 88 and a half years half-life, so it's not the same stuff. Right. It's the 239 that right. is the long one. We know how <coughs> to change it to something else. And for a while, actually, there was a program to convert it to what's called MOX, metal oxide, and put it in a nuclear reactor so that you change the radioactive material to something that is either completely burnt or other elements that have much shorter half-lives. In my opinion, if you're going to bet on the future, you need to give people of the future the chance to do that rather than expect that you can contain it for 240,000 years. And so if that appears to be a plausible approach, you should not be burying it on the ground. I disagree with the lady. You should give people of the future the chance to deal with it. Yes, they weren't responsible for it, but they are likely to be able to deal with it. So that's one. The second is that nuclear power is actually going out of fashion. And so the problem is, is the stuff we have already accumulated. It's not that this is going to keep on going forever. And so we have a transient problem that needs to be solved, which I think after a while is going to be a finite amount of stuff, which my guess is will be dealt with along the lines I'm suggesting. And the last point, there are languages that last more than a thousand years. Uh, I'm happy to read Homer to you if you would like. Thank you. So the, 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 the two, there are several different kinds of waste. Uh, there is surplus plutonium weapons grade that stored quite a lot of it at Savannah River site. It's that plutonium, which includes some that was under treaty brought from the former Soviet Union, that was mixed to make the MOX fuel. Um, then there's the stuff, the, the residue from the processing of making it, which are in these million gallon tanks, 51 of them in Savannah River, uh, 177 of them in Hanford. And that's a sort of uh, which is brew of all sorts of stuff, including unstable organic chemicals that are releasing hydrogen, and they're a real mess. So the MOX uh, avenue was really open, is really open for the surplus weapons-grade plutonium. The stuff that's being buried in the WIP site so far is not that. It's uh, all the stuff that got contaminated in the making of uh, in the extraction of the plutonium. Um, and then there's the stuff in the tanks. The tanks is being, you separate out the, uh, the worst of the worst stuff there. You mix it with grout and other things, and you make it into these glass rods. Right now, those glass rods are being stored at the Savannah River site. They were supposed to go to Yucca Mountain, but that's not for mocks. That's something else. So the, of those three streams, the one that is moxable, so to speak, is the surplus plutonium. I think that's not a bad idea. Uh, burying, and, and they'll surely mix the plutonium with something before they bury it. They're not going to bury weapons grade pits of nuclear weapons there. That would be too much of an incentive for someone to dig up. Um, so that's sort of the, that, that scenario. If you want to keep stuff above ground, then, or in a retrievable form, and that's what the French have decided to do. 
uh, they've said, look, we think it's undemocratic to bury things in a difficult to retrieve way. We think we ought to put it aside so that every generation makes a new decision about what to do. It's very expensive, and it relies on assuming political stability over several hundred years. Interestingly, the Americans believe, who've had relative political stability, up till now at least, uh, and um, for several hundred years, uh, but they don't trust polit the politicians or the political stability or institutional stability. They trust that the rocks will protect it. And the French, you know, have had, I mean, this is the fifth republic, so you can, get, you, you can say they've had uh, nine or 10 different governments over the last uh, several hundred years. And they trust the political stability of the future, and they don't trust the science and technology to solve this once and for all. So they want to simply get the stuff in you know, titanium alloy containers, whatever it is, enough you know, forward to a generation or two in the future, then they'll solve it in a new way. And each, you know, it'll be more like a relay race than a long pass. And I, I'm sure there's people in the room, I'm sh quite certain there's people in the room who know far more about this than I do. But there is research, of course, about using spent fuel rods and certain kinds of nuclear reactors and you know, molten salt reactors. And, you know, creating the conditions that you're just describing. And, you know, so, and that would be great. I mean, if, if that were possible, that would be just great because then it solves all kinds of problems. I think the statistic I read, I think, is like if you took all the existing nuclear waste and used them in this way, you could power the Earth for 70 years, something like that. I don't exactly know the number, but that's what I recall. And so, I mean, so far it hasn't been viable. And also it's out of fashion, but out of fashion suggests it could come back into fashion so I, I think it's like a way to think about something. And I, maybe it'll head in one direction only. Maybe this, we, we will find other sources of energy. And um, so you can tell me later. The, the one thing I didn't mention, which is important, uh, I am aware of these discussions and how they have evolved. One thing you do not want, unless you can find people smarter than ones we have around, is if you have this giant processing scheme of transmuting all this radioactive weight, waste, how do you make this a non-proliferating yes. path? Yes, exactly. So protection from proliferation actually won much of the argument. But you see, that's again a societal problem and, you know, gates, guards, and guns, right? You could decide that you're going to invest the effort to do this. And the other thing is I would not mix the plutonium with the million-gallon tanks because you can chemically separate the things that have very long lives, and you can deal with those one way, and then you have the rest that have shorter lives, and you would deal with those some other way. So just uh, to complete that. That is what they do. They do. At, at, at Savannah Riverside, they take the stuff in the tank, they bring down, they get rid, evaporate everything they can evaporate, they take the remaining bit, they isolate the most problematic stuff, the long-lived stuff, they, they make the glass logs out of that, and the, ra the remainder they actually make these sort of huge concrete barn size blocks with. Uh, the issue there is whether the concrete will maintain its mechanical, uh, chemical mechanical integrity over time, but th that, is, that is what they try to do. They don't just dump everything into the logs. They separate it, as you know. Um. It was extraordinarily eerie to be in towns that were uninhabited and basically now inhabited by um, feral cats and crows. Um, it was our job, and in a way, it took us a long time to come to this, but how do you film a radioactive landscape? Like, what is a radioactive landscape? Um, and in a way, what you see are these abandoned buildings and cars on top of other cars and you know the foundations of buildings exposed. But that's tsunami and earthquake damage. That's actually not radioactivity. Um, and we talked a lot about how to film that. But ultimately, what it seemed like is what you're filming when you film such a thing in 2013 was 
something that happened in 2011 and not addressed for two years, uninhabited for two years, and its temporal displacement, the fact that humans hadn't gone in there for two years, the fact that it was staying the same, is what a radioactive landscape is. You can't see the radioactivity, but you see the effect in the landscape in this way, and it looks like you're seeing earthquake damage or tsunami damage, but actually you're seeing a radioactive landscape. And it took us a while to get the eyes to see such a thing. Um, it was unsettling to have, be wearing Geiger counters, to be having the numbers go up and the numbers go down, um, and to feel, um, having a visceral feeling of like going over a ridge. You know, the wind moves around the cesium, moves around the strontium, something that was clear yesterday is now more radioactive than it was. It's, it accumulates in puddles. You sort of don't know. Uh, and the not knowing is also part of what a react, the uncertainty is also part of what a radioactive landscape, and it was quite compelling. And I, I know, you know, one of the reactions, I mean, a lot of what I felt is not very complicated, but it was surprising in a way. One of them is, you think about Fukushima naively, you think, well, okay, there's a plant, and then there's a radius around it that's re radioactive, and then you get beyond that, and it's fine. But of course, it isn't like that. Actually, there are parts where you can get quite close to the plant and have very low radioactivity, and there are parts where the wind blew the cesium, especially the cesium-137, up in the hills very far away, and you'll get to a place in the hills uh, where there are guards and blocked off roads and so on because the radioactivity is too high to be safe to go into. Um, another thing that was surprising to me was, again, this is obvious once you think of it, but the older man's, you know, they're... Mr. Sasaki wants to go back home. He goes back every other day, but he can't live there because he's not afraid of the radiation. He's in his 80s. He says, you know, what's it going to do to me? Uh, and, but he says, there's, there are no doctors. There are no nurses. There's no grocery store. There's, there's no pharmacies. There's nothing. So moving back, you know, it's, it's one thing when people say, well, they should just move back. But how? You know, you saw the school. The school is rotted out. And, he, and then there was an interesting moment where one of our colleagues at, at Harvard, not somebody I know, but from public health, knew the same statistics that we, you know, was using the same statistics, which is about one in 100 people might get cancer if they lived in the sort of average radiation near the plant for a lifetime. Um, and he said, you know, and 30 people would get it anyway from something that has nothing to do with radiation. So if you're 30 out of 100 are going to get cancer, what's one more? And he said, well, why, why are people so worried about this additional one person? Whereas to, to me, you know, like our local high school has 1,700 kids. If you told me that 17 of those kids were going to get cancer because of something in that school, I'd never send my kid there. I wouldn't even, it's not even a discussion. So, you know, even when you know, even if you agree on the, the statistics, you can come to very different conclusions. So that's another thing. So it's the instability of the environment. The, you know, the, if, or another thing is, if you leave your house, it rots. This is a rainy part of Japan. Even if you leave your house in the desert, near, you know, suburbs of Phoenix, for a couple of years after the 2008 housing crash, a lot of those houses aren't inhabitable. But you put them in, in a place like this where the rain is, is all the time, and that's why the woman, the young woman, Mrs. S, is going back there, is she's trying to keep the house so that it, they even have the option of going back there getting rid of the mice, getting rid of the mold, getting rid of the, all the other things that happen to a house that isn't inhabited, the, the rain spring. So there, these things, keeping up a house, the deterioration, what it means to re-inhabit an area, uh, the, in, the fluctuating levels. There's a playground we went to. There's a big Geiger counter. And it, you know, it would show the moment-to-moment -moment radiation level in the playground. Uh, people have on their refrigerators little maps about which roads to go on. I mean, there's very, not that many people there, but like a lot of the men who work uh, in things associated with the plant have long-term jobs, as one does have in, in Japan, and they want to stay. Some of their families have left. They, they talk about atomic divorces. Um, uh, their family has left. Um, but of those people that do remain, they, they're, you know, they're trying to navigate an area with no stores, no infrastructure, no schools. How do you take your kid to the playground? It was very, it was, people were extremely nice to us. I mean, we, you know, in the midst of what's really kind of a tough way of living uh, on all these levels, they were very gracious and, you know, we spent a lot of time with, with fishermen, with people testing the fish, with people growing rice. I mean, there's a lot that is not in the film that, you know, just spending time uh, in the different sectors of that economy.
Thank you.